Tide Run. We're, we made it. We made it to the Anchorwick U. We're like super excited about that. It's 2000 years old and some say that this is the actual spot where the Magna Carta was sealed and that the tree witnessed it. 2000 year old yew tree. You could actually go inside. It's incredible. So we thought this was a good spot. Even Rud Rudyard wrote a poem about it. And I'd like to read that to you. I only went and nearly lost it. <laughs> it says, so all the, so the barons of all England came with little trust, but sure of aim, the powers of the king to tame by rush and sedge and reed. There is a higher law than royal will to the charter John must set his seal and to earth new seeds of freedom fell in the fields of Runnymede. Though islands float in the Thames no more and ceaseless streams of traffic roar, yet there remains a place of awe by rush and sedge and reed. It is earth's healing now we seek from the roots of wisdom let him speak, O sacred you of Anchorwick in the fields of Runnymede. And still when mob or monarch lays to rude a hand on English ways, to whisper awakes the shudder plays across the reeds at Runnymede, and Thames that knows the mood of kings and crowds and priests and such like things, rolls deep and dreadful as he brings their warning down from Runnymede. That's Kipling. So we made it, we made it to the tree. And I'm going to read a bit more, maybe on another video, maybe on this one, we're going to pause and I'll carry on so it can be cut. Um, just from The Makers of the Realm by Arthur Bryant and he's got a section on the charter and it's about three pages long there. And of course we're doing this because Article 6, one of the Magna Carta was invoked in 2001. And um, this brings us to investigating the constitution and our history and going around England campaigning and canvassing with Common Law Ascent. And I've wanted to come here and read that poem for ages. So uh, we've done um, Egham and Staines yesterday canvassing and we'll probably hit well, the nearest town to here, which I can't remember. The name. <coughs> Sorry everyone. I'm sorry, I can't remember. Hey Viva. Anyway, should we carry on? Thanks for tuning in, we really appreciate it. So on, the, on June the 15th, the barons, among them the mayor of London, met the king in the meadow beside the Thames, in a meadow who beside the Thames called Runnymead. For five days, their pavilions remained pitched by the river. With John were the archbishops of Canterbury and Dublin and the pa papal legate, legate? <laughs> seven other bishops, the, the loyal magnates of the council, his brother, William of Salisbury and his chamberlain, Hubert de Burr. The charter to which, at their advice, he set his seal was ostensibly a restatement of ancient law and custom. It began by guaranteeing the liberties of the church, a reply not only to John's confiscation of its revenues, but to his father's constitutions of Clarendon a half a century before. It promised that the king should not without general counsel, that is, without the consent of the great council, demand scutage or aid from his tenants in chief, other than the three regular aids long recognised by feudal custom, that the heirs of earls and barons should be admitted to their inheritances on payment of the customary reliefs, that the estates of heirs in ward should not be wasted during their infancy, nor widows robbed of their dowries or forced against their will to marry royal nominees. It laid down that no free man should be imprisoned or dispossessed save by pro process of law and the just judgments of his equals. That's that no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or deceased or exiled or in any way destroyed, nor will we go upon him except by the lawful judgment of his peers or the law of the land. That he should not be taxed unreasonably or to his ruin. That his means of livelihood, including the merchant's stock, the craftsman's tools and the peasant's wainage should be free from immersement, that London and the chartered boroughs should enjoy their ancient liberties, 
that merchants should come and go safely in time of war, and that the foreign mer mercenaries should be dismissed. Oh yeah, because he employed foreign mercenaries to uh, try and uh, extract uh, taxes. Um, it provided for the regular administration of the judicial system, ordered that the common pleas should be held at Westminster and not follow a preambulating court, that none should be made justices, bailiffs or constables who did not know the law of the land, that sheriffs should not sit in judgment in their own shires, that two justices with four knights of the shire should hold assizes every count in every county, every quarter, that royal writs should not be sold at exorbitant prices or withheld from those entitled to them. To none, the king was made to swear, will we sell, to none will we deny or delay right of, of justice. Should we go up closer? So lovely here, you can literally just have a place to yourself in the morning. Um, in all this, the Charter, which consisted of more than 60 clauses, was a recital of the wrongs suffered by Englishmen under a tyrannical king, and as men of property, and above all landed property, were only the subjects with legally enforceable rights, it confined itself in the main to setting out particulars of the redress granted to them. It was a charter of liberties, and to the medieval mind, a liberty was a right to the enjoyment of a specific property. It was a freedom to do something with one's own without interference by the king or any other man. Called Magna Carta because of its length, the charter was not, therefore, a declaration of general principles, let alone of human rights. Medieval men thought of these only in connection with religion. The Charter enunciated no theories. It was nothing if not specific and practical. Yet, though its chief beneficiaries were tenants and chief of the crown, it was a national as well as feudal document. It made no distinction between Norman and English and guaranteed the liberties of small property owners as well as large. 32 of its 61 clauses dealt with the relations of the king and his subjects and not merely his tenants in chief. We grant, it declared, to all the free man, men of our realm, from us and our heirs forever, all the undermentioned liberties to have and to hold for them as our heirs from us and our heirs. And it established two precedents of immense significance for the future. One was that when an English king broke the feudal compact and gave his vassals the right, universe, yes, that he broke the feudal compact, and gave his vassals the right, universally recognised by feudal law, to renounce their allegiance, it was not necessary to dissolve the bonds of political society and disintegrate the realm. Magna Carta was a substitute for de deposition, a legal expedient to enforce customary law that left the king on the throne and the sword of civil war undrawn. Government in England, though exercised by the king, was to be rooted in justice and based on law, or it was not to be accepted as government at all. This was Langton's supreme achievement and England's. Magna Carta was the first great political act in the history of the nation state, itself an institution of which the English had been the pioneers. The unity of the barons in the face of John's injustice and their decision to act within the law had created a new phenomenon, a corporate estate of the realm to prevent the unjust exercise of power by the realm's ruler. The taxpayers had combined to control the tax imposer. Magna Carta was the product not of a rebellion, as it seemed at the time to the king and his more bitter opponents, but of a revolution carried out by process of law. By the provisions for summoning the Great Council before any new aid or scutage could be granted, it made a representative assembly of feudal tenants, a, a preliminary to taxing those tenants. This was something wholly new, and in establishing the principle that the king must conform to the law which he administered, it created a constitutional device for compelling him to do so. 
in addition to provisions for regulating the summons of lords to the council, archbishops, earls, bishops and, the, and greater barons by individual writ and lesser barons by collective summons through the sheriffs, the charter contained a clause by which 25 representative barons chosen by their order were to become its guardians. They were to observe, keep and cause all to be observed with all their might, the liberties it guaranteed. Should any of them be infringed and just, and just redress be refused, very relevant to today, these 25 lords, almost all of whom had served or were the son of men who had served as royal officials, were empowered to take up arms against the king to enforce the charter. The indignant John was made to admit his subjects' right to restrain the wearer of the crown whenever he infringed their liberties. These barons he had to announce on behalf of himself and his heirs, with all the commons of the land, shall distrain and annoy us by every means in their power, that is, by seizing our castles, lands and possessions, and every other mode, till the wrong shall be repaired to their satisfaction, saving our person, our queen and our children, and when it shall be repaired, they shall obey us as before. By this device, though a clumsy and primitive one, the men who had wrung Magna Carta from the king sought to ensure its permanence. It was dictated by fear and the just belief of the barons that the moment their force was dispersed, John would try to destroy both them and their settlement. Even in the hands of less distrustful, of men less distrustful of the sovereign they were seeking to bind, it would have probably been unworkable. Its dangers were clearly foreseen by Langton, who tried, though in vain, to introduce a mediating body between the king and the barons' council. They have given me, declared the furious monarch, 25 over kings. Yet the pattern of constitutional thought thus set was to be re reproduced in a thousand forms in the history of the English nation. It is still enshrined after seven centuries in the words of our national anthem. May he defend our laws and give us call, ever give us cause to sing with heart and voice, God save the king. It was a prayer that the best of those who stood by the king's shoulder at Runnymede had tried to realise. Then it goes on to the uh, arguing that ensued afterwards. <laughs> so I, I'm sure that was a pretty long video. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I might read Article 61 while I'm here because maybe this, this tree has seen it all before, <laughs> but on another video. And please find our pages. Yeah. Yeah. You're not on them already. Come on, Laura Sent. <laughs>